Jennifer TV of second episode. Today we're going to be talking about sight reading. Let's get into it. There's a difference between sight reading and reading. Essentially sight reading is when you're going to sit down and look at something and try to read it on the first go, something like that. Whereas reading can be more involved when you're trying to learn a piece. Often you're reading through it at a very slow tempo. You might be taking long pauses. You might have more attention to musical detail, but you're not necessarily so concerned with maintaining a specific tempo. When you are looking at a piece, there are some basic things you need to notice. First off, what's the time signature? What's the key? Second is going to be look for rhythmic anomalies or the smallest rhythmic division. So if there are say 16th notes somewhere later on in the piece, you don't want those to catch you off guard. So you want to set a tempo where you're going to be able to handle those 16th notes. Okay, so we're going to jump into an example from Soar's Opus 60. This is going to be number six. Let's take a look and figure out what we need to know before we start reading. So first off, it's in 2-4, good to observe, and there are a couple rhythmic things that jump out to me right off the bat. In measure 7, you'll notice that there is a dotted 16th to 32nd note, so that's going to be something that if it's not an ingrained rhythm to you, you want to observe at first, so we'll go through that in just a moment. Now, there are a lot of rests in this piece. These particular rests are serving more as indications to help us clarify which voice is which, and not so much rests that are supposed to help us intentionally mute. For instance, in measure 21, we don't have to mute the bass line every time. It's more just to indicate that there's a rhythmic alternation. But let's go back to measure 7 and figure out what we want to do here. Now, it could be that this doesn't look concerning to you at all, in which case you can just jump right in. But I want to figure out what's going on first, just so it doesn't catch me off guard. There are going to be four 30-second notes for each eighth note. So I'm just going to ta these out. This is going to be ta 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 So next up, we've got a big topic we haven't covered, which is key, and in conjunction with that, accidentals. Now, this is going to start out in the key of C major, and it goes through for the first two sections, really up through measure 16, it's gonna just stay in C major. Now, you'll notice the second section actually is no longer in C major. And one big red flag we have to tell us that it's not in C major is that there's consistently a G sharp both in the melody and sometimes in the bass. Basically, the G sharp is indicating to us, okay, we've got a different key going on here, and it's actually A minor, so the relative minor of C. But that G sharp is a leading tone to A, so that's gonna help us see, okay, there's something different going on here. So I'm gonna, my hands are gonna need to know that I'm reaching for G sharps now. Now for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm not going to be taking the repeats just because it's going to take a little bit too much time. But while you're at home, always be sure to notice repeats. And if you do choose to skip them, be sure it's intentional. One and two and one and two
noticed I made a couple mistakes when we were running through that piece. In particular, the slur in the second to last measure didn't really come out very clearly, and I played a C where I should have played an E. But the important thing is that I noted what was happening and kept going without losing that sense of pulse. One of the important things about sight reading is knowing that you're not perfect and you're not always going to play it perfectly. But being able to move on and get the rest of the piece is almost more important than anything. If you're reading something and you find it's a little bit too difficult, first rule is always probably slow down. So you want to be sure that you're taking it at a tempo that you can manage. Don't get frustrated, just slow down. One great place to find music that's in the public domain that you can just print right at home is IMSLP. Now, like I said, Source studies are actually on there, so you can find the entirety of the op Opus 60. I would highly recommend SOAR as a great place to start. So, have fun, go find some music, and spend some time sight reading on a daily basis. It'll really help benefit you both as a player and as a musician and as a thinker. For the first new exercise that we're going to be doing today, we're going to go with a slightly longer pattern, also preparing things on the top four strings of the guitar. And we're going to be playing the fourth string, third string, second string, third string, first string, third string, second string, first string. So basically, four, three, two, three, one, three, two, three. So let's do this together four times. Prepare. 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 All right, again, much like the last version we've done last uh, session, we are not preparing the other three fingers until the, the thumb starts again. So we're only preparing at the times that I showed you with my other hand and I shouted the word prepare at you. So um, <laughs> we're only preparing at the end of the pattern. This is a slightly longer pattern than the one we had last time, but other than that, it's not much different. Let's do one now that is a little more interesting. We're just going to be reversing some notes from the one we just did. Ready to listen? We're going to do fourth string, second string, third string, second string, first string, second string, third string, second string. So basically, four, two, three, two, one, two, three, two. All right? What's interesting about this pattern is that, for me, the easiest way to prepare it is without the index finger, without I. So far, we've always been preparing all the fingers on all the strings every time. So uh, that works, of course, but in this pattern, we have some parts of the arpeggio going down rather than up. For me, generally, when I do right hand preparation, it's easier to do it in an arpeggio going up than in an arpeggio going down. This preparing all the fingers for an arpeggio going down is a lot more difficult than preparing all the fingers for an arpeggio going up. Reasons for that are complicated, but I just want to make to bring to your attention the fact that these are not identical. It does matter which way your hand is going. This is easy with preparation. This is hard with preparation. All right. So for this pattern, what we're going to be doing is preparing the P on the fourth string, M on the second string, and A on the first string. Okay. And the I is not going to be prepared. I'm not going to be holding it out like there. I'm barely barely holding it not on the string, almost touching the string, but not actually on the string, right? So for this one, we're going to be preparing these three fingers only, playing the fourth string, and these two fingers stay on, on, the, on the top two strings. Then we're playing the middle finger, and this finger stays on the guitar. Then we're playing the index finger without bringing the middle finger back, and playing the middle finger again, then playing the A finger, and the end of the pattern with no preparation at all. We're only going to be preparing again for the next one, which is also just PMA, no I being prepared on these strings. Sorry. Again, this is a really bad angle. Don't hold your guitar like this, okay? Just showing. In general, the rule for me is, and there are exceptions to this, up, if I can, if the music allows it, going up, I prepare, and going down, I don't. Or 
or maybe I prepare just the thumb, but generally I don't, okay? Now let's do one more other uh, unusual case, somewhat more unusual case. Um, let's think of Villa Lobos etude number one, you know? You might have played this piece before, maybe you have not played it before. You don't need to know it in order to practice what I'm going to give you now. Uh, but basically what I'm going to be doing for this is I'm going to place the thumb on the sixth string, index on the fourth string, middle on the second string, and A finger on the first string. So uh, basically I have six, four, two, one, okay, as my preparation. And then I'll play the pattern without moving the other fingers. until now. 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 So basically, I am trying to show you that some situations call for more complex preparation. And you can sort of start to see a pattern here. When we're going up, we prepare. When we're going down, we generally don't. I'm going to bring you more examples in the last of our four sessions. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking more about applying uh, this to other, uh, other situations. But um, in the meantime, uh, if you have the etude number one already practiced, you know, you have all these chords that follow, you know, on top of each other. You can actually play etude number one with all of the patterns that we've done before. Just to recap what we've done so far, block chords contrasted with bass plus three notes, contrasted with all four notes one after the other, followed by up and down, followed by the longer pattern we did today, followed by the opposite pattern we did today without preparing the eye, Finally followed by Etude number one by Villa Lavas. Where the pattern you are preparing is six, four, two, one. Practice all of these and I'll see you next time. Welcome to Jeffy TV and this is TY. Uh, to cultivate a firm foundation for guitar's left hand fingers, we have learned the changing fret and changing strings exercise from the last lesson. Next, we're going to explore the flexibility of our left hand. Us guitarists will use the magic of our brothels to mimic the free and lyrical human voice. In this lesson, we're learning how to practice the vibratos in order to develop a confident ability to apply this technique even in difficult musical passages. So let's first put our first finger, left hand, first finger, on the lowest string, sixth string, fifth fret. Let's try to apply the vibrato technique. Okay, so where does the power come from? Let's try to feel. The power is come from our wrist. It's a wrist-driven vibrato. So feel your wrist is pulling your hand, your fingers, your fingertip, left, right, left, right. Try that on all four fingers. Remember, it's your wrist making the initiative move. Remember, it's very important to keep your hands fairly relaxed, but have the, the amount of power to hold the note so it wouldn't buzz. Okay, so now let's apply this technique on a little exercise. We use the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, very useful exercise for this vibrato study. We're going to play it in six different ways. So the first, we're going to play it on the bass octave, starting from sixth string, ninth fret. We're going to use Or you can just remember it as playing on the fifth position. Okay, so let me demonstrate the first two small phrases.
pay attention to the transition of fingers. Make it smooth and precise. And keep going on to finish this pra uh, practice. And remember to relax your hands in between intervals. Okay. And now, next, let's apply this on the treble strings. It's going to be slightly harder because it's very smooth strings without the metal. Okay. So, also, fifth position, we're going to use C, D, these notes. Very few notes, very good exercise. Uh, I do this every day, first thing in the morning. Okay, so let's start. Remember, it's a wrist leading your whole hand. Important to lighten up all the joints of your hand, left hand. Uh, if we practice with very uh, strong power, very firmly, we're wasting energy, and uh, we're going to make our hands very stiff. It's hard to move. Okay, so that is the second way. The third way is com combining the both octaves. So this will require us to be uh, fairly fluent on each of the octaves. And then we can apply them together. Okay, so now let's try this a little bit. Mm. It's like this, okay? And uh, since we're adding one more finger on the fingerboard, this will re restrain our hand from moving freely as the previous exercises. Uh, but don't worry, over time and pay attention, try to feel how can we make the hands more flexible and create a more vibrato sound. And next exercise we're going to do is having a bar on the fifth fret with our point finger, first finger, and then do the lower octave and higher octave. So the fourth way is having a bar on the fifth fret while constantly and doing a vibrato exercise on the lower octave. Since we are applying a bar the whole time, it's going to make our hands um, feel tired so much more sooner than the previous exercise so uh, keep remember to whenever you feel tired you can take a break and put down your hands and shake your hands and uh, come back to finish the exercise yeah avoid injury and next of course is going to be the higher octave with bar The final ultimate exercise is to double octave plus bar. Okay, let's try this. Okay, finish this exercise, you are good to go. Remember? To feel the pressure on your fingertip, don't apply too little and don't apply too much. And always practice at a slower speed to feel the movement. Let the movement sink into your muscles and your joints. Enjoy the exercise and you're good to go. See you in the next episode. So last time we talked about improvisation. And we focus specifically on the idea that improvisation is spontaneous composition and that it involves the parameters of sound. We talked about five of them. So this week we're going to go over those and then we're going to talk about specific strategies to spontaneously compose and then compose in a way that also uses written notation. So first, here are the five parameters of sound that we hit on last time. Dynamics, 
which involves weight on the string for the volume that you want to create. Timbre, which we talked about as being related to coming towards the bridge for a bright sound and coming over the neck for a very dark sound. Then we talked about duration, the length of notes that you choose. We talked about register, if you're playing up high on the neck, in the mid-range, in the low range. And we talked about the envelope of the sound, which is giving the note a different shape by using pizzicato, which is also muting, by sliding into notes, by doing hammer-ons and pull-offs, harmonics is a great way to change the envelope of the note, bar talk pizzicato, all kinds of different things that you can do. So hopefully you've been practicing with those things, freely choosing your notes, playing all over the neck, and just feeling really comfortable doing that. Now, the next bit of strategy is to set a parameter when you spontaneously compose. Grab a recording device. You can use your phone and use video. You can use audio on your computer. You could use a tape recorder if you have a tape recorder. What you're gonna do is set a timer for 10 seconds. Then you might set it for 15 seconds or 20 seconds, but the shorter the better. And then you're gonna say to yourself, okay, when I improvise for these 10 seconds, I'm gonna use a bass line that I create, maybe with something high. So you're playing with register, and then you're playing with the other parameters. So for example, you might just start to improvise a bass line. Here's one with some of the notes I used in the previous lesson down here. And then you're gonna play it differently. And then you're gonna listen back and see like, oh, was that, did I like that? What, what more could I do? Maybe try it again. Maybe this time you'll take the bass line to another place as well as changing the parameters of it. Maybe next time you'll use different parameters. Maybe you'll say, you know what? I think I'm gonna to start to play some beautiful dyads, which are intervals together. Maybe your idea is to create as much contrast as you can there. But the idea is that you're going to try to create a complete idea in a very short amount of time. And you're going to start to feel what 10 or 15 seconds sounds like and feels like when you're improvising. We all have this sense that if you play for a short time, you can't create contrast or you can't set up an idea. But the truth is you really can. And so this exercise, the 10 or 15 second exercise, is a really good way to start that. So set yourself some parameters of what you want to play. Choose some parameters of sound or choose them as you're spontaneously composing that really show the mood that you want to create and set your timer and start to see if you can start to create little tiny pieces. It's a great way to get going with spontaneous composition. Next, what you might find is there's something you really love that you played just spontaneously. You improvise something and you think, you know, that's a cool thing and I want to keep it. Like for example, what if I wanted to keep my bass line? I might write it out and then I might think, well, what if I played it a couple times forwards and then what if I wrote it out backwards and played it backwards? What if I did this? That could 
be a really cool bass line. What if I took one of the notes and put it up higher in a different register? What if I went like this? I change register on some of them, which means if I had an E down low, I suddenly put it up high. And then I start to write all that stuff out. And then what might happen is I see something I really like and I want to play around with it either by writing different notes or playing different notes. And then I might sit down and just the way I spontaneously compose that piece when I improvise, I might just write notes out, just any note head. And then play those, interpret those with the parameters, change up the rhythms, change up the parameters and see if I have something. And then what starts to happen is all of these little ideas, these 15 second improvisations, these little bass lines or melodies that you grab from your improvisation become things that you can put together into a larger piece. So try that out this week. Go back into your parameters, practice everything you have there, and then start to create 15 second spontaneous compositions through improvisation and then start to write some of that down and play around with the order of the notes and the register of the notes and the rhythm of the notes and see what you can start to put on the paper. Happy spontaneous composing.